welcome. Let's stand together, Ironwood, and worship our God.
Here we stand on this foundation, hope as an anchor, faith is our flag, the cross is our courage, your word is our way.
Amen. Well, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, and uh, we remember together the day that Jesus entered uh, into Jerusalem uh, amid shouts of, and cries of Hosanna, which means the Lord save us. So we're going to uh, commemorate that as we read this passage of Scripture. I'll read the uh, kind of yellowish part, and y'all read the italicized part. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Amen. Pray together. Father, this morning we come lifting up the name of Jesus, our Savior. And God, we are so excited to get together as a church family to remember as we head into this holy week what he has done for us. God, give us a fresh awareness of the saving grace that we have tasted. And hear our hearts of worship as we give it to you, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Amen. Hey, as you turn to take a seat, would you say good morning to somebody? Well, good morning. How we doing? Nobody's asleep yet. Well, good morning. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors here at Ironwood, and it's just my privilege to get to welcome you this morning, especially if you're a guest with us. We're so grateful that you're here. We love that you came and tried out uh, our service today, and we hope you have a good experience. Um, if you would love to uh, get any questions answered or uh, get to, to uh, find out some more information for next steps, stop by our info desk in the lobby on your way out. We've got a free gift for you there. We'd love to meet you. All right, so as Matthew mentioned, it's Holy Week leading up to Easter weekend next week. It's a big weekend. We're expecting a lot of people. It's going to be a fun weekend. In fact, I think we've got 24 baptisms for next Sunday. Yeah, that never gets old here in God's grace. It's just what he's doing in people's lives. So it's going to be a great day. But one of the things that we're trying to do to best accommodate you all is to prepare and so as we are preparing, how many of you have already filled out uh, the RSVP, the Easter at ironwood.com to let us know what service time you're coming to? Okay, a number of you. Great. Thank you so much. That helps us a ton. For those of you who haven't, pull out your phone right now. Go ahead. Grab it. Scan the QR code. Go to Easter at ironwood.com. What we would love is for everyone to let us know what service time you're coming to. And this helps us plan accordingly. So our kids' ministry teams, our guest service teams, our parking lot teams, all across the board, we would love to be able to just know who's coming, how many people to plan for. And so as of this morning, uh, you can see we've got 8.45 and 10.15. We're pretty full. Uh, that was a couple hours ago. Um, and the outer line services are a little bit lighter. So if you're somebody that doesn't have strict brunch plans already in works, maybe consider looking at those outer line times uh, to attend to. But we, we'd love to have you, regardless of uh, what service you come to, make sure this week you're inviting friends, you're making plans accordingly, and then let us know um, what service you're planning to come to. All right? Sweet. Well, now we're going to turn our attention to God's Word. So go ahead and grab your Bibles and turn to Genesis 12. 
And when you get there, if you're able, would you stand with us for the reading of God's word? Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. May this word of the Lord help us live with wisdom and faithfulness. You may be seated. Thanks, John. Good morning, everybody. My name is Seth. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I get to teach this morning. A couple weeks ago, I was sitting in the sauna at the gym, and I was just asking people probing questions, and um, I asked one of the guys, oh, you got kids? And he said, no. I said, oh. That sounds like more of a conviction than an accident. And he said, it is. I think it's morally wrong to bring children into this terrible world. And I said, I assume you haven't ar arrived at that conclusion lightly. Uh, how, did, how did you get there? And he says, well, um, I'm an orphan. I was raised by the foster system. And from home to home to home, I had mostly... Whatever you imagine, the worst terrible experiences were in those homes. Then I was trying to do something with my life. And so I, I joined the U.S. military. And I served in Iraq. And I, I saw a lot of friends pass away. And I have lots of PTSD. And therapy doesn't help. Uh, he told me about how he's had trouble making and maintaining meaningful friendships besides one person who was his Uber driver at one time that he now goes to brunch with intermittently. And he said, I cannot justify bringing children into this world knowing with absolute certainty they will suffer tremendously and I can't do anything to protect them from it. I said, wow. And so he said, do you have kids? And I said, yeah, four-year-old and two-year-old. And he said, how do you justify bringing children into this accursed place. And I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the rationality. I appreciate the conviction. And I appreciate the question. Because I think Christianity has a great answer for that question. And I think that answer is actually the text that I'm teaching today. And it's the question, it's the answer that I gave him. I was rooted out of Genesis 12, 1 through 3. This question... Uh, of, that's set up by the text here in Genesis 1 through 12 is really that whole question. How do you justify going on living when things are terrible? How do you question, how do you justify bringing other living beings into this thing that hurts a lot, creating pain? Genesis 1 and 2, God creates the world. Genesis 3 through 11 is the story of breakdown, of decay, of rebellion, of suffering, relational, spiritual, physical, Social, difficulty, cursed, breakdown, decay. And then Genesis 12, 1 through 3, what you're teaching on today, is the hinge, the direction changer. That actually sets the trajectory for the rest of the Bible all the way till Revelation chapter 21, in the very end. That in the midst of this cursed and broken world, God is doing something and he's doing something through and in his people, and they are called to be the blessing in the midst of this curse. But that raises the question, what even makes for a good life? See, last week I talked about the rise in mental health issues that we see, especially in young people, and how a big chunk of that has to do with being hyper-plugged into the internet and filling our minds with way too much information that we can do anything about, kind of this dopamine circus carousel ride. But there's this other piece. I remember here, I heard a, a, a therapist on the internet say one of the things he had noticed is that a lot of these people with like pretty severe depression, 
when he talks to them, they actually don't have any mental health issues. They're just soberly assessing the fact that their lives are not worth living. They're, leaving, they're leading and living meaningless lives, and so they're sad. That's not a mental health issue. That's sobriety. So what makes for a meaningful life? What makes for a purposeful life? What makes for a good life? A life that on your deathbed you won't be filled with if I had only or I should have or I could have. Lots of books have been written about the types of regrets people have on their last day. And today's sermon is really about how do we invest ourselves and live our lives and live the type of, as the type of people that on your last day you're mostly full with a sense of accomplishment and not a sense of, well, that, was that even worth it? There's this book, probably one of my favorite books that I've ever read outside of the Bible or like Christian books. This is not a Christian book, but it's written by a Jewish psychotherapist named Viktor Frankl. The name of the book is Man's Search for Meaning. So Viktor Frankl uh, is a Jewish psychotherapist who got put into the concentration camps at Auschwitz in World War II. So all of the bad stuff, it's there. And he got put into this position with a bunch of other Jews. And after they'd been in the camps a while, he started to see a lot of his acquaintances and friends lose the will to live and then die. But some maintained this sense of drive and fight. And a lot of them still died, but a lot of them ended up making it. And so he's trying to ask the question, how come these people lost the will and these people kept the will? What happened? And so what he says is that he, in a moment, in asking that even that question, he imagined himself in the future delivering a lecture on the situation in someone's heart that gives them the will to live or lacks the will to live. And all of a sudden, he was overcome with a sense of purpose and meaning. And instead of just suffering his suffering, he was a student of his suffering. And he found a cause greater than himself that gave him the energy to keep fighting for life. And he summarizes some of his findings in that book, Man's Search for Meaning, and here's a quote from it. He says, don't aim at success. The more you aim at it and make it a target, the more you're going to miss it. For success, like happiness, cannot be pursued. It must ensue, like be a byproduct. For it only does so as the unintended side effect of one's dedication to a cause greater than oneself or as a byproduct of one's surrender to a person other than oneself. And he's noticing that it's not pleasure or possessions or, or, or power that are actually motivating him, but it's something else. That the human experience, the life that we are living, is not primarily a journey towards pleasure or power or possessions, but it's actually a search for purpose. See, Freud, Sigmund Freud, taught that life is really about the pursuit of pleasure. If you want to understand what's wrong with people, you have to find out where they got inhibited in their search for pleasure. Other people, like Karl Marx, taught that life is about the will to power, the desire to conquer, to rule, to do the evolutionary task of the strong over the weak. That's actually the accumulation of authority that's really the search that people are on. That's why people have kids that won't have power. And so you have kids and you realize, that didn't work, I don't have power. <laughs> or the, the American dream, the accumulation of possessions, that the meaning of life is to accumulate a big pile so that I can give my kids a head start on accumulating a pile. So they can give their kids a huge head start on accumulating a pile. But pleasure, power, and possessions, part of the reason I think people are generally depressed and have this sense of malaise and purposelessness is they, a lot of people get there. And guess what? For what? but it's actually a search for purpose. And I have good news for you today. You don't have to go to Grand Canyon University to find your purpose. <laughs> you can go to Genesis 12, 
1 through 3. So you want to live a good life? Here's the big idea. Be a blessing. This is the meaning of life. This is the purpose of your life. This is why God is acquiring a people to himself to dispense and send out into the world. To be a conduit, a channel, a vehicle, a, a, a dispenser of blessing. And so we're going to see Genesis 12, 1 through 3, Abraham's story and how our story is similar. So let's look at it. Genesis 12. This is the hinge point, the pivot. We've been hearing about how cursed the world is, and now we're going to see God bless a man. So now the Lord said to Abram. So I'm going to use the word name Abram and Abraham interchangeably. His name gets changed to Abraham later. I'm not doing that on purpose. It's just going to happen. Don't be confused by that. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your kindred, and your father's house into the land that I'm showing you. The first thing that has to happen is Abraham must leave. Abraham is in his comfort zone. He is in a place of security. He's in a position of being fine. His country, his kindred, or his tribal group, and his father's house, especially in the ancient Near Eastern culture, would represent economic security, relational security, and uh, personal security. That he has a reputation, he's known by the virtue of his father's house, and he's in a comfortable position, and he's generally doing fine. And so when the Lord tells him, Abraham, leave, he's not saying all this stuff is bad. What he's saying is, you will be tempted to see your blessings as saviors, and they're not. These things are actually false senses of security. Having a big property, living in your dad's basement, (laughs) being known in the community in which you were raised, not necessarily bad. But if you cling to these things as your source of self and security, you have to understand those things can be taken from you and they don't last forever and they're actually false promises of security. I had a mentor one time, I was telling him I was praying about my future, and he said, you are not praying about your future. And I said, but I am. And he said, no, you're not. And I said, what are you talking about? This argument is not going anywhere. And he said, you come to the Lord, Lord's table like this. You have one open hand and one hand closed behind your back. And he said, whatever you want, Lord. And he's like, you're not praying about your future. You're fake praying about your future with a tight fist closed behind your back. Until so both hands are open and you're actually yielding your whole self to the Lord, you're just fake praying about your future. you got to real pray about your future. Both hands open. Lord, will you have me do? And this is kind of what God's telling Abraham. All those things you're tempted to find your identity and security in, leave them. Again, these are not bad things. But he's pulling the rug out on seeing these good things as ultimate things. One of the test cases we have to find is, what could I lose, and if I lost it, I think I would lose myself. There are a lot of things you could lose, and if you lose them, you should sad, be sad. You should grieve. You should say, that's not the way I want it to be, and grieve. That's appropriate. But if I lost it, I would lose me. Who am I? Like, what could I lose that might trigger an identity crisis? Some of you are like, I don't have to think about it. That already happened, and it's tough. Yeah, so we have to open our hands And not see our blessings as saviors, but see our blessings as blessings and see the Lord Jesus as Savior. The providence of God, what part of things he's going to do is to pry open our hands from these things that are good, but they are not the ultimate thing. And when he says, leave your father's house and go to the land that I will show you, he's sending him out on an errand without a destination. You just got to leave. I'm sure Abraham had a thousand other questions. Who, what, where, when, why? He's like, no, just leave. You got to go. Trust me. Take the step. Trust me. Go for it. I'll show you eventually where I'm going to have you land. Abraham probably had plans with his life. It's not right to assume Abraham was just kind of like sitting around doing nothing with no purpose. He probably had hopes, dreams, and he says, nope, changing that, taking him away. Abraham has to leave. Specifically, he has to leave the bubble zone, the bubble comfort zone thing. That looks like different things for all of us. The next thing that's to happen is Abraham has to be blessed. This is what's different between Abraham's story and the Babel story. In the previous chapter, you heard about Babel, who's like, let us make something great for ourselves, lest we do what God wanted us to do. They want to create a name for themselves. 
And here, God tells Abraham, I'll make you a great nation. I will bless you to make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. The difference here is Babel wanted to bless themselves. They wanted to earn it. They wanted to do it for themselves. And God's telling Abraham, no, I'm going to do it for you. That aspiring, like wanting to make your name great for the sake of your, make your name great, bad. But there are, there's this reality that God protects and creates reputations of people so that they might accomplish things out in the world. And so Abraham must be blessed. And here's what's one of the hard things about being blessed is it requires acknowledging that all of this stuff is not earned but is a gift. I will bless you. Some, I talk to some folks who are truly blessed and they feel icky acknowledging that and saying that because they have this like internal sense of self-hatred or like I shouldn't be blessed, somebody else should be blessed. And I'm like that tension is actually part of what blessing inherently creates is you're going, I didn't earn this and I have it. And so rather than kind of going, I shouldn't have this, whip, whip, we should respond with gratitude and say, the Lord has dispensed tremendous things into my life. You might have accumulated your blessing bit by bit every two weeks with great paychecks, but guess what? Your talent, your skill, capacity to delay gratification, work ethic, discipline, the ability to show up, the car that starts, the AC that works, blessings. See, what happens sometimes in our life is uh, there's like two big errors here. One is we think that there's like this bell curve of the human existence, and way on this far end, there's curse, which most basically means to subtract or take away negative, negative things in my life. Then like way on this side, there's like blessings, like winning the lottery or like having a child. And there's everything in the middle, which is just like normal stuff. It's not really a curse. It's not really a blessing. And I want to tell you that that belief that there's stuff in the middle is not biblical. Reality, there's only two types of things. Curses and blessings. If there are socks in your shoes, those are blessings. If your car started this morning, blessing. AC's working, Blessing, nice chair to sit on. Blessing, coffee in the lobby. Blessing, oh, a single relationship where someone cares about you at all. Blessing. When we label this whole middle thing as something that's not a blessing, what that does is that produces entitlement in us. And we presume on these things. And we feel like we deserve these things. And we think that they ought to be there. And when that happens, you begin to erode all sense of gratitude. You're no longer thankful. There's two categories for things, curses and blessings. And we would do well to be way more mindful of our blessings. And here's one of the things that's important for us in this cultural moment in particular, is we live in a society that wants to incentivize and reward how many boxes you can check on the curse side. The more boxes you check on the curse side, the more your voice matters, the easier it is for you to promote, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like a, a, it, and here's what I want you to hear. Everybody experiences different levels of intensity and severity on the curse. Not everyone suffers the same. But everyone is born into a Genesis 3 through 11 world. And when we fixate, ruminate, take inventory of, and pay special attention to all of the things on the curse side, we develop what could be called a victim mentality or a victim rewarding culture. And it actually is bad for our mental health and our mental well-being to ruminate, fix on, and notice, and pay attention to, chiefly of all things, the negative stuff. If you want to play Where's Waldo every day with everything that's bad in your life, I promise you, your sense of meaning and purpose in life will do this because we tend to see what we're looking for. We tend to find what we're looking for. Therapists in this church, outside this church, I talk to them, what are some of the most common practices you recommend to clients? And almost all of them, without exception, talk about this practice of like a daily or semi-daily gratitude journal. Wake up in the morning, something you're thankful for. At night, what were you thankful for today? Partially, 
to like actually develop a list and have an inventory of, look at all the things I have to be thankful for. The world is constantly trying to get me to pay attention to everything that's wrong, and I'm trying to pay attention to what God is doing in the midst of everything that's wrong, and I'm training myself to see and take an inventory of and count and notice and name and be thankful for my blessings. What you look for, you tend to see. And we need to get in the habit of trying to see these good pieces. Not just because it promotes positivity, but because it promotes gratitude to God, the benefactor who is working to bless us in the midst of this cursed world. It's not just a mental health coping strategy. It's a sober living in God's cosmos strategy. One of the core things that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 1 when he's defining sin is that they did not honor God or give thanks to him. The root of sin, you could say, is ingratitude. Adam and Eve in the garden, I don't like what God gave me, I want that other thing. Ingratitude. Abraham must be blessed and he must believe that he is blessed if he's going to do this. So if we as a church want to be a light in the midst of darkness, want to be a blessing in the midst of this cursed world, part of the work of that is becoming mindful of how God is blessing us on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Now, what I'm not saying is that we just like put our fingers in our ears and pretend like the suffering's not there. That's foolish. But what I am saying is developing an eye to see and believe that we are blessed is key. So I've been thinking about this this week, and uh, one of the AC units in my house went out the first week I needed the AC unit because it was like 86, I don't know, and I'm a huge wimp on sweatiness. So turn the AC on, and it's like, and then it just starts getting hotter in the house, and like, not a good sign, get a Google Nest notification, urgent issue, and my tendency when things are not supposed to do, not doing what they're supposed to do, especially technology, is just to get irritable and fussy and annoyed, and I get mad at the uh, corporate money laundering scheme of air conditioning, you know, and insurance companies, they don't actually want to pay for anything, they just want to, ah, you know, they're just trying to keep you, like, they're going to send someone out in like two weeks because they don't actually want to do it, and I just kind of get, and partly because I'm preparing for this sermon, and I also want to generally live a meaningful life and be a joyful person when I can. I'm going, okay, let me think about, okay, I have two AC units, which makes me extremely rich by most definitions of rich that I can think about. So I can just crank this one and I have a fan and we'll do this and that's great, making the most of it. And then I'm like, this is literally the best week of the whole year for AC to go out. Because if AC went out in August, that would be like way worse than this. This is a hassle. That would be like leave the house, go to hotel situation. And so trying to in the midst of a low-grade, difficult situation, I found myself, even just trying to notice and name things to be grateful for in the midst of that, I was not a irritable husband all weekend, which meant I was a huge blessing to my wife, you know, <laughs> so she was the most thankful of all people was, was her. But we, we have to develop the daily and situational discipline of looking for God's hand in the midst of true difficulty. Our, our assets are not saviors, but they are blessings. And our assets are not just our possessions, but they're our presence, our person, our calendars, our, our training, our talent, our disposition, all of these things. We should not cling to them as saviors, open-handed, we must leave, but at the same time, we should call them what they are. They are blessings. Sometimes it can feel like this like, hyper-spiritual thing, like, oh, I'm just so blessed, and it can sound like phony and lame, but sh- we've got to like, resist that, that God is investing into our lives on a regular basis, individually, households, corporately, and we've got to take inventory of the ways that he's doing that. Next piece is Abraham must be a blessing. So think about it like this. If you, like, I'm going to take like, uh, like obesity as a metaphor here, that if that's too many calories in in, in contrast with calories out, so then we, we kind of like store it up, 
we're storing up energy, uh, the same condition can happen spiritually, emotionally, relationally. That if we have a bunch coming in and we just store it up, we become like a bank unto ourselves. But even like banks, if they don't lend out money, they tend to die. That's like they, there's people save money, the bank lends money. There's like this in and out flow that makes for healthy institutions, individuals, and families. That, there, that there's an investment and then there's a reinvestment. That's how it works. That the, the investment of God is meant to be a conduit through us. So we're not just called to be blessed so that period thank you, I'm blessed, but we're supposed to be blessed for a purpose. And this is what we get in Genesis 12 too. I will bless you and make your name great so that, it's called a purpose statement, so that you will be a blessing. Why have you been blessed by God? Because he loves you, yes, and because he loves the people around you so that you would be a blessing to them. God's investing into you so that you would then reinvest that into others. This is the trickle-down process here. Now, the question of like how we do that is, is the key. There's really kind of two horizons or frameworks I want to think about. There's the ordinary or the temporal, which is like the earthy blessing. I'm talking about like finances, health, buildings, budgets, pragmatics. Then there's like the spiritual eternal, which I think is the bullseye, and it's the most important, but it's not even close to being the uh, only important thing. And so I want to think about two stories about how we might be a blessing specifically to the people around us. And the, and the first thing I want to talk about is the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now this is one of the more famous stories, but I want to just look at it with a fresh lens in light of being a blessing. A man was going town, so this is Jesus uh, telling a story about what it means to love your neighbor. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robber, robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed. That's curse, right? I'm not talking about Harry Potter when I'm cursing people. You know, I'm talking about detracting or destroying the flourishing of other people. Like, so, again, it's not abracadabra cursing. It's, it's taking away the flourishing, taking away someone's life and hit, becoming an inhibition. Uh, some of us in this room you're mostly a curse to the people around you because of your attitude, disposition, and, and character. And so step one towards being a blessing is stop being a curse. So there you go. There you go, step one on that. So it says, these robbers leave him half dead. They cursed him. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place he saw him, he passed by on the other side. This priest and this Levite, you think that they would go, oh, remember Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the father, Abraham, blessed to be a blessing. Here's an opportunity. No, they see the opportunity and they avoid the opportunity. Their lives are uninterruptible. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He sees the curse and he's moved with compassion towards it. His heart is not pre-calloused. He's not sick. He can't, it's not he, that he sees compassion when he sees uh, the fruit of the curse. He went about him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, like a thousand dollars, and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I'll repay you when I come back. So this Samaritan gets talked about a lot. I just want to highlight one aspect of it. One, he's clearly got some financial margin in his life. Here's a guy who's suffering. Here's a thousand dollars. He's clearly got some control over his schedule. He's probably on the way to do business. And he's like, oh, I'm going to let myself be interrupted. And I'm going to act in love to this person. And then he goes and gets the guy set up, puts him on his donkey, bandages his wounds. He's not just hiring contractors to solve this suffering. He's personally involved. He's generous with his presence. Then he goes, all right, you take care of him a little while. I'm going to go do my business, and then I'm going to come back. And the phrase that stuck out to me this week is, whatever more you spend, I'll repay you. This guy cuts a blank check to the innkeeper. So clearly, he doesn't just have some financial margin. Clearly, he has very little financial anxiety. What if he spends four more denarii? Oh, no. 
So he's a, probably a business guy who's got himself in a good position, and he's generous with his time, he's generous with his presence, and he's generous with his emotions, and he's generous financially. And this is a great example of be a blessing. Doesn't just pray for him and say, you know, do you know what's going to happen when you die? See you later. <laughs> but what are pictures? Some of us in this room gotten yourselves into a really great financial position. You've developed tremendous skills, talents that are highly marketable in our current economic situation. And I think it's important for everyone to try to be able to connect the actual work they do to the flourishing of society. That your work itself can serve to be a blessing as you subdue the creation unto the common good. But also, having a bunch of capital and assets that you are prepared to be a blessing with is awesome. The question is, are you interruptible? Do you have eyes to see the opportunity? And are you actually prayerfully looking for an opportunity to be a blessing? Because dying with a huge pile of stuff is impressive to nobody. And you won't be here because you'll be dead because you left a big pile of stuff. But looking for opportunity to be a blessing temporally. And then the last piece, which I think is the bullseye of being a blessing, is the spiritual piece. This is what Paul says in Galatians 3. So Paul is reflecting on this Genesis 12 text, which he calls this text in Genesis 12, the gospel preached ahead of time. So it's the first preaching of the gospel, is what Paul says. Now then, it is those of faith in Jesus who are the sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So what he's getting at is to be a child of Abraham is not purely to just be a Jewish person, but it's to be someone who has faith in Jesus. That this blessing to Abraham and his descendants is for the church. It's not just for ethnic Jews. And so he's saying, all of you people who believe in Jesus, you are the descendants of Abraham by faith, that you're being blessed. And he says, in you shall the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. The best blessing you have ever received, period, without exception, is salvation through the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. That is the only blessing that is a Savior, Jesus. All the other blessings are just blessings. But the blessing that is a Savior is Jesus, and God gave him to us, and we are now the ultimate pinnacle of blessing by every sober definition of blessing, which is that you know God and you have the capacity to introduce other people to God. Some of you have a lot of capital and you can be a blessing in earthly temporal ways and a lot of awesome strategic ways. Great. Some of you have basically none and what you all have in common is that the most important aspect of blessing, which is walking with Jesus and introducing other people to him, we all have that in common. That is the mission of this church. We're not baptizing people next week because it's something fun to do. We're baptizing people next week because we're blessed to be a blessing, and the blessing is being channeled through us individually and collectively, introducing people to Christ that they walk in newness of life. So when this guy in the sauna says, how do you justify bringing children into this cursed world? I said, well, me and the people I'm leading in my household, we don't think the goal of life is to avoid suffering at all costs. We're supposed to not like suffering, but the world is cursed, and we, we plan to live in that world. But we actually think the goal of our life is to be a blessing in the midst of that curse. And for my life, and for the life of my children, and the life of the people out of the church I'm helping lead, we are trying to be a blessing in the midst of that curse. And that's how Paul understands this. So in Genesis 3 through 11, the word curse or a curse is talked about five times. And in Genesis 12, you can count with me what happens here. And I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I'll curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That the fivefold curse of Genesis 3 through 11 is being undone in the fivefold blessing in Genesis 12. That God's antidote 
for the cursed world is a blessed people who are committed to being a blessing. You want to know what the hope of the world is? It is the bride of Christ, being the bride of Christ, pointing people to Christ. And so if you want to live a good and meaningful life, the most important question you'll ask is how will I be a blessing? So let's pray and reflect on that. Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. Give us creativity and the capacity to think about how we might specifically function as blessings. Give us the eyes to see and the courage to dispense what you've given us. Let us be faithful conduits. In your name we pray. Amen. We're going to take the remainder of our time together to respond to that preached word. And we're going to do so in a couple of different ways. And uh, just like we do most weeks, the band will lead, lead us in singing. And what an opportunity to take the, the blessings we've received from the Lord and respond in song and in praise and in joy. And so let's worship loud together. We also have giving boxes in the back of the room as well as that number on the screen. That's an opportunity to, to be a blessing to go we've been blessed with material goods and resources that we can use to really bless those in need and right now we're going to take communion the lord's supper and this is a reminder that we do every week by the by jesus himself's prompting um, to do to remember him to remember the bullseye of, of this blessing which is salvation and so if you're a christian in the room if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, would you go ahead and grab the elements out? Uh, they're underneath the seat in front of you. And uh, if you're here today and you'd say, Jesus is not my Savior, he's not my Lord, then I would ask you to just um, take this moment, don't participate, but rather consider what is your purpose? What's your identity? What are you living for apart from him? Jesus, the night he was betrayed, uh, when he was with his disciples, he took two physical, tangible things to have as reminders. And he took this bread, this unleavened bread, and he said, this is my body given for you. Eat and remember me. Let's eat together. And then likewise, he took the cup and said, this is a cup representing a new covenant. We're no longer trying to sacrifice our way towards uh, removing our sins. Jesus' blood washes us pure and clean forever. And so we rejoice that we've been made new by him. Let's drink and enjoy it together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, the author and perfecter of our salvation and our faith. God, we're so grateful for the gift. We have been blessed with a new future. God, we've been hopeless and helpless in darkness and given new life. And God, help us to live with the purpose of giving you glory and honor and telling others about that hope. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, would you stand and let's sing together. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now. Where there is praise, he will inhabit. And there will be grace and mercy all around. Every bird will be lifted in his presence. Every trophy will be laid down at his feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all.
unto the Lamb. Honor and glory, worthy is He who overcame, buried in shame, risen in power. He is alive, the stone is rolled away. All our worship will belong to Him forever. Death is conquered, and our Savior holds the keys. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. It won't be long, we will behold Him, and every tear He'll wipe away. We'll be at home, the war will be over, soon we will meet our Savior face to face. Every burden will be lifted in His presence. Every trophy will be laid down at His feet. There is a name that reigns above all others. Jesus Christ, the King above all kings. Above all kings, Jesus Christ, the King above all kings, Jesus Christ, the King above all
Amen. Our lives are worth living and have purpose and meaning because he lives and he has sent us out to be a blessing. If you're carrying something heavy, we'll have a prayer team in the back left of the room who'd love to help you go to the Lord with what it is you're dealing with. I'll be out in front of room 100, which is just through those doors and to the right. If you're new, I'd love to meet you. John Cronin will be out there as well. Uh, but before we go, benediction, I'd like to pray over us as a church. Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see how we've been and continue to be blessed. Empower us to leverage those blessings as a means of loving our neighbors unto your glory. Fill our hearts with joy as Good Friday and Easter are fast approaching. Amen. Love you. Have a great Easter Sunday.